let's have some fun. Okay, so we're talking about the having, obviously, and um, this after this talk about the having, uh, we will cover everything you've ever wondered about the having, and you'll never have any more questions about the having or Bitcoin in your life anymore. We are taking questions now. That's a joke. You feel free to laugh. Get that, get that microphone closer. You get the microphone closer. Okay. Okay, so, um, Greg, what is the having? So, in Bitcoin, uh, the block subsidy is what has kind of bootstrapped this process. Uh, block subsidy is that uh, miners, uh, every 10 minutes on average, find a block and they get paid for their work. And roughly every four years, uh, every 210,000 blocks, that subsidy gets cut in half. Uh, the thinking of that is that it um, incentivizes the finding of cheaper and cheaper energy sources and it incentivizes the, uh, the creation of better and better and more efficient mining equipment, making the Bitcoin network stronger and stronger and stronger over time. So uh, is the having a, like a stock split or something? No, Sean. Or does Satoshi <laughs> cut the price in half? <laughs> I didn't understand what you said. So, uh, yeah, I think Sean's gone through some common mis misconceptions. So we all have some friends that uh, have uh, have asked us about the having, and uh, it sounds like you got a few of the uh, the normal <laughs> questions. Well, let's let's run through them. Yeah. So so I always get you know. Oh, I've had a buddy who asked me uh, probably five times if it's a stock split and I've explained it over and over again. So this is why we're doing it for that one buddy. This, this video is for you. Um, but yes, uh, w one of the amazing things about the having too, that, uh, that's really important to me is the having shows the scarcity in Bitcoin in the first epoch, uh, there were 10 and a half million Bitcoin that were mined and every subsequent having all added together, there can only be 10 and a half million or just under 10 and a half million Bitcoin mined. So the halving is what makes the 21 million cap and the halving is what makes Bitcoin scarce. And it's also the monetary policy of Bitcoin as well. And so if, what's the alternative to the halving, uh, which was placed one time in 2008, October 31st, but really came into effect in January 3rd, 2009, and the monetary policy of Bitcoin remains unchanged since then. What's the alternative? Is the Federal Reserve with their FOMC meetings that they have eight times a year, every single year since, well, maybe not since 1913, they've been having eight meetings a year, but they've been having eight meetings a year for a very long time and they continually change monetary policy. So that's the difference between the fiat and the sound money that we currently have with Bitcoin. It's a lie. Right? So these people come and meet eight times a year and decide how they're going to make everybody in the world poor. Right? And we don't get a vote. They're not democratically elected. And we don't get to see who the, uh, the shareholders are for this private corporation that dictates how much poor we get every year, which is complete BS. Um, so the lie is that a dollar is a dollar. And I think everybody here knows that at this point, a dollar is not a dollar, especially when we don't know what the issuance rate is or what the issuance rate is going to be in the future. So that's why I like to call fiat a lie. And it shows in, it, it shows in sharp relief what truth Bitcoin is showing us, right? So with Bitcoin, we get truth every 10 minutes, roughly. So every 10 minutes, the state of the chain is validated by all the nodes, right? You get decentralized truth every 10 minutes. It's clear. It's open. Everybody sees it versus, well, how much, uh, how much poor are you going to get today, Sean? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> yes. And that's, and that's the thing is there, there's the difference between sound money and the, and what we currently have in the fiat world. And that's a lie. And and one of the things about the having, as we celebrate it, it only happens once every four years. Um, one of the things that always comes to my mind is why did Satoshi put in the having? You know, because I don't think he ever detailed it out 
And it's actually a very ingenious thing that he included in Bitcoin. You know, he could have just done every block just slowly ch chip off a little bit in the block subsidy, but he decided to do about once every four years, he's going, we're going to have a huge supply shock. Why do you think he did that? I think Satoshi had a, uh, a good grasp on human nature. So uh, one of the things that uh, humans tend to do is when you see something happening or you get used to something, you predict that that will continue into the future, right? So there hasn't been a volcano eruption today. You know, we, we expect that tomorrow there will not be a volcano eruption. Uh, there hasn't been an asteroid impact this week. So we expect that there won't be an asteroid impact next week. And that serves us well most of the time. But when we go to the store and we expect a dollar to buy an apple, but the next day it costs 50 cents, or sorry, the next day it costs $2, and the next day it costs $4, and the next day it costs $8, right? That, that exponential change really messes with the computational paradigm of the economic system. So Satoshi flipped it on its head and said, all right, we're not going to let the, the industry stagnate. If we want this thing to really bootstrap itself, I need a mechanism to incentivize people to make better equipment, uh, evangelize the system and to, uh, to make circular economies like you see in new Berlin. Um, that's why I think you put the having in. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we can speculate, we can speculate why, I mean, maybe he wanted a certain way to issue it, to get the coins out faster. Um, I, I'm sure obviously uh, that was one of the reasons, you know, if he waited forever, then, then it might take longer. So just boom, get a lot of coins out quicker and then it gets cut in half and becomes more scarce. You know, we almost, we almost are at 99% issuance of yeah. Bitcoin. I mean, already. I mean, he had to reintroduce the concept of scarcity to the human population. So what better way to do that than tell people every year, especially the people that are intimately involved in the process, your payout is going to get cut in half. Figure out how to make that work. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I like, so there's a lot of different things about the having that really impact my mind. The other thing is, is everyone knows that Bitcoin is volatile. And as I was studying Bitcoin and I, as I was newer to Bitcoin, that was a thing that, you know, that a lot of people would say to me was Bitcoin is volatile. And yes, it is. It is very volatile. Um, but as I understood about the having, and as I look back in history, I realized that Bitcoin, it makes higher highs and higher lows every single having, or in other words, it goes up higher in dollar terms and it hits, it hits a new high every cycle and it hits a new low every single cycle. And that low is always higher than last cycle's low. And that high is always higher than last cycle's high. And so that kind of, when, once I was able to stretch that out into a four year concept, then it really made me feel okay with saying, yeah, you know what, maybe it is volatile. Maybe I will go down, but I don't, you know, you don't buy your house. And then on the next day, you check the price on Zillow of what your house price is, you know? And so your Bitcoin isn't something that you're trading every single day. And, you know, it's something that I've said before, right? You don't buy a house and check it on Zillow, but it's true. You don't buy your Bitcoin. And then why are you looking at it every single day? The whole goal is to stack more and to add to that stack. And over a long time period, four years, then that price will continue to go up because of the having supply schedule. I mean, it also it also throws into sharp relief how much of a lie it is that inflation is a good thing and that in order to grow an economy, you have to print more money, which is total BS because every four years, the amount that Bitcoin issues gets cut in half and that economy seems to be growing at an exponential rate. So it shows you, you know, between Austrian economics and Keynesian economics, which one is a more functional system? You know, which one is better for Earth's populace? And for me, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It looks to me like we've been lied to since about 1913. Um, and I am really hopeful that more and more people are waking up to the fact that uh, the quantity of the money does not need to increase. In fact, the productivity of the human race is what is going to go ahead and be pushed into Bitcoin and increase its value instead of it being distributed over more and more fiat units. So where does Bitcoin go from here with the having up? Oh. Forever? 
forever. You know, there's a, my favorite meme about this is that there's a, there's no top to Bitcoin because there's no bottom in fiat. So after a while, uh, when you're in Bitcoin, and I'm sure plenty of you here have experienced this, you stop watching number grow up because it stops, it stops making sense after a while because instead of measuring how, how much more wealthy you're getting in, in fiat terms, uh, you start to experience what deflation is. And it's this, it's this boogeyman in the world today. Oh no, we're going to experience deflation. That's going to be bad for everybody. But you know, personally, my experience with deflation is that everything in the world is getting cheaper for me every year. Well, the issue, the issue with that is those are Keynesian economists that are saying that. So in the Keynesian world, deflation is bad because everything is based on a credit based system. So if everything that we've ever had, all the money that we've ever had is based on credit, which relies on inflation because we need to have money now be worth more than money later and we can inflate away any type of debt or any type of any type of purchase that we make then you need to have inflation because imagine trying to buy something on credit and your money is worth more in the future how do you ever pay that back oh, it's, and, in, it's invisible shackles on your population right so when you yeah. take when you take out a loan you're you're borrowing from the future you know it's uh, it's pulling pulling forward i think is what uh, is what the economists call it Stealing. That's called stealing. It's called Greg. stealing. It's called stealing. It's called theft. But, uh, you know, what it does is it, uh, it, it takes debtors, which is everybody in the modern economy and turns them into slaves, uh, slaves with bonds that they can't see. And you you've been programmed to get the thing now at the cost for your future self which is totally backwards, right? So you should be saving now for the benefit of your future self. And again, it's just another paradigm that Bitcoin inverts. So as you save, as you save in Bitcoin and you sit on it, uh, when you, when you eventually go to spend it, you find that the things that you want just get less and less and less expensive. And as Jeff Booth says, that's, that's part of the exponential nature of the productivity of humanity. So, so, so will there be loans on a Bitcoin standard? I'm honestly, I don't know. That's a question I used to ask. And it, it's a conversation I had with, uh, with somebody yesterday at the pool. Um, Preston? No, it was, uh, more credible is his Twitter handle. Oh yeah. Uh, more credible. And now we're sitting, he's got a, uh, he's got a business where he does, uh, it's a, it's a, an industrial laundry business and it's a family business and he's been orange pilling his father on it. And one of the ways he, he orange pilled his father is that, uh, they did a, uh, a loan through, I believe the company was unchained, right? So instead of a zero down 0% interest loan, uh, what they'll do is they'll take an over collateralized loan. So you put down two and a half times the amount that you want for the loan, and then you pay the loan back over time and then you get your, your collateral back, but you have to have the capital to pay for the thing first in a Bitcoin standard, which is a lot like it was in the gold standard. You just, you, you save for the thing you want and then you pay for it with the, uh, with the profits from the sweat off your brow instead of getting it instantly for free and then paying for it later. Just another paradigm we invert. Yeah. It, make, it makes me think of Guy Swan had a really good analogy just for money in general, which was, you know, the fishermen, you know, in the old days before there was money, the fishermen could only fish for that day. Because any fish that he would save, if it would go bad, then he couldn't keep the wealth of the work that he did. And so with money and with Bitcoin, as that fisherman can save, now he can sell that fish. And so he's, and he can store up his work that he's made over one day and he can have more wealth for future days by doing work in one day. He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have to rely upon his work every single day. And I think that's the whole idea is with, with this new paradigm of money, it's not money that comes from nothing where you create a loan out of thin air and it's nothing. It's actually from the money is the asset. The money is real. It's not credit. It's not fake, but the money is, cr is created from your work. Your it's actual wealth. And so your money nowadays, it comes out of nothing. Most of the time, for, especially for the people who are getting all these loans, you can reprice everything in these loans. And so nowadays, 
with Bitcoin, it's actually backed by your work that you do. And that's the whole paradigm shift is you have to have the money first off to be even allowed to make the loan. Yeah. It's just another fiat lie. I mean, it's not, it's not exactly money from nothing. You're stealing from yourself. Just nobody tells you that. And that sucks to come to the realization of I've stolen from myself quite a bit over the years. <laughs> um, and it was a, it was a hard pill to swallow. Um, but I'm glad I did. Okay. So another thing that having reminds me of, or taught me is when I was, when I was learning about Bitcoin, there was a big ICO phase, right? Um, which if you're not familiar, the ICO phase was, it was short for the uh, initial coin offering, which is a takeoff of IPOs, which is the initial public offering. That was back in 2017 or so. There was a ton of altcoins that came around. They had nothing to do with Bitcoin, but everyone thought that Bitcoin and crypto were the same. And so did I. Um, I thought it was part of the same family. And um, as I started to go down that rabbit hole, one of the things that led me to a Bitcoin only understanding was... I would notice that, you know, there's this thing called alt season that people would talk about. And every time that, and like, when would the alt season happen? It would happen after the Bitcoin halving. So then I was like, okay, well, let me see, you know, does he do any of these altcoins have a halving at the same time as Bitcoin? And, and then, you know, I start studying, I start looking, it's like, no, they don't. None of them do. Yeah, and, they pre-mine 70% up front. <laughs> yeah. They're all pre-mine. They're all garbage. And they're all running on the back of Bitcoin. And they're all running off the hype of Bitcoin. And they don't have the scarcity. They don't have the decentralization of Bitcoin. Um, they don't have what Bitcoin has. And they don't have the having. And so it just really brought to my attention that the having, it means so many different things. It brings to mind the scarcity that Bitcoin is. There's only 21 million. So if there's only 21 million, there can't be more other altcoins because that would add to the 21 million. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. The volatility is okay. And none of the altcoins matter. And so it was just a huge eye-opening moment for me that this is what the having means. It's what it signifies. And it's bringing truth. It's monetary policy. That's all it is. It's just a monetary policy. It's money with, with rules that are set one time and we keep those rules forever. And there's no committee. There's no one man that changes those rules. Unlike fiat, which is a money with rulers who can change those rules whenever they want to for their, for their benefit and for our expense. I'm glad you said that because I've got a question for you. So, uh, yes. So <laughs> how do you see, uh, Bitcoin evolving into the global financial system, um, in the next decade or so? Uh, well, we're here in El Salvador right now. Yes. You know? Yes. That's correct. That is correct. We are in El Salvador and, um, this is the beginning of how Bitcoin evolves into a global, uh, a global monetary system and it already is, it already is a global monetary system. Uh, and it just takes education in my mind. And that's why the guys from my first Bitcoin, I really like what they're doing because you know, you can't learn how to Bitcoin if you don't ever take the time to study it. And so as more people continue to study it, they'll make that shift. And then I think there will be a time period when enough people accept, accept Bitcoin and enough people are using Bitcoin that um, people will just grow into it, right? Like your kids will just grow into more of a Bitcoin world. I understand that, but I want to back it up a little bit. I'm more along the lines of, I think you and I are both of the mind that the current global financial system is in decline and, and, and breaking apart. Yeah. So what is, is Bitcoin's role in that? Is Bitcoin's role to like accelerate the breakup or is Bitcoin's role to help facilitate a, a, a slow decline and transition? It is to Bitcoin is the arc in essence. It's Noah's arc. It's not, um, it, it's, the thing that we can hop onto as the flood is coming, uh, which is hyperinflation, which is the breaking of the dollar. And as we decide to make that hop, then we can be on safe ground. And if we decide to not make it, 
then you get washed away financially. And that is how I see what's happening with the dollar. And the dollar is going to go through hyperinflation, whether Bitcoin was around or not. But as Bitcoin is this is this thing that we can smoothly transition into, if we decide to, then, then we don't have to go through as much pain. Uh, personally, there will probably still be a lot of pain just globally during that time. Right. So a lot of the financial systems in the past are usually, are usually based on some sort of economic uh, backing, right? So you've had economies that ran with silver backing, economies that ran with gold backing. More recently, we've had uh, the petrodollar, where, you know, uh, basically the world economy ran on the back of oil. Um, and now it seems like it's, it's, it's more along the lines of the global reserve currency is backed at the barrel of a gun. And as that breaks down, I don't think it's going to be just an immediate switch to Bitcoin. I think somebody is going to take it to back a fiat currency to at least keep that country solvent for a little while as they make the transition. Do you, do you see something like that happening? Yeah, I think every, every, every attempt to keep the right of seniorage will be, will be made because there's people who want to be able to issue money. And that is the whole issue with altcoins in essence. And that's the whole issue with, with government currency is people want to have the right of seniorage where they can print the money and they have access to the money. Uh, and with Bitcoin, that, that's a money that no one can control. So yeah, I think I definitely can f foresee a future where we move from the dollar to a digital dollar and it's a CBDC and it's full of surveillance and it's full, you know, and it will disappear on you, right? There'll be an expiration date on your CBDC. Um, you won't be able to store your wealth in it, but the government will give it to you as, as incentive to, to switch on to their CBDC system instead of being free with a money that won't have surveillance with the money that, that won't stop you from spending on cattle or beef or whatever you want to buy or an airplane. Uh, and so that's the difference is we'll, there will be the incentives and if you're strong enough, you won't fall for it. And it'll be up to us to decide, you know, will I fall for the CBDC or will I choose a freedom world with Bitcoin? So you're saying you think they're going to go from lying to us to doubling down and like exponentially lying to us. <laughs> maybe, maybe that sounds about right. So yeah, whenever you think of fiat, whenever you think of dollars, whenever you think of euros, pesos, all I want you to think about is lies, 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 because you, in contrast, you can always look at Bitcoin and see truth, 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 truth. It's never going to lie to you. It can't. So what do you think are the future implications of the having on Bitcoin as like a, a store value or a, a medium of exchange? Well, Bitcoin's obviously already a store of value, you know, just like what you said, things are getting cheaper for everyone. If you've held Bitcoin for the last year, two years, three years, no, four years. Take out three years. <laughs> if you've held it for the last year, two years, or four years, uh, it's a great store of value for you. And three years, it'll be a great store of value for you very soon. Um, but that's the whole part is there's three store, there's three types of money, which is the store of value, the medium of exchange, unit of account. And as we move from store of value, like what we're seeing in Berlin right now and in Bitcoin Beach is the Bitcoin circular economy, then you're starting to see those medium of exchanges popping up around the world. You know, you have, there's Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala too, that not many people know about. Um, there's Philippine Island, um, which we have a couple of people that have been there before. Um, there's different places around the world that are popping up, even in Africa, where there's becoming this Bitcoin circular economy because they already recognize it as a store of value. And now it's moving to a medium of exchange. And soon things will be priced in sats. And as that happens, then we'll see people will only accept sats and they won't want your dollar. And, you know, there's already people that we work with that, you know, certain vendors for the having party that would only accept Bitcoin, which is awesome. You know, give them a shout out. Which vendor? Seedment. Seedment. 
Seedmint from Switzerland, principled. All right. So, you know, anybody who's a sound money advocate, uh, which is a lot of the folks in the room today, um, if you've done your uh, if you've done your history, if you've done your research, uh, some of the things that might scare you are stuff like uh, Executive Order sixty one hundred two when they confiscated uh, all the gold, privately held gold in the United States. What are the potential challenges uh, for Bitcoin as it becomes more integrated into the global financial system? I'd like to throw that question back to you. You first. No, you. It's your event. You go. Should we ask? Should we ask Yellow? Yellow. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. It's <laughs> 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 having a conversation. All right. So uh, for me, it's the the big red flag is the ETFs. Um, so if you know anything about your history, you know that, uh, uncle Sam doesn't like competition. So when you create a honeypot and Larry described Larry leopard Lepard described this, uh, well yesterday in a talk, um, you've got a large percentage of the circulating supply of Bitcoin held in one, two, maybe three institutions custodied at one or two. And all you need is one or two employees afraid of going to jail uh, to sign off on a, a transaction. You know, and then if you're if you're sitting with custody coins in something like uh, I'm not even going to mention, let's call them the ETFs and the big evil blue and white company. Uh, if you've got your coins sitting there, you are now at risk of having them taken from you and then given whatever Uncle Sam decides is a, a fair fiat exchange value for that. So they're going to take your, uh, your hard money and give you the soft money and tell you to be very thankful for that. Um, so that, that's my fear. That's, that's one of the biggest challenges I see as Bitcoin integrates into the global financial system because fiat's going to tell you it's safe, but what have we learned so far about fiat? It's a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> so are you telling me that Bitcoin not held in self custody is not Bitcoin. What well, I'm telling you, it's an, it's an IOU for Bitcoin, and right now, it seems decent, but I can't tell you when or if that IOU is never going to be redeemable again. Yeah, I would agree. The guy, the guys at Simply Bitcoin, Nico and Opti, every single day, they go hard. And the, the biggest thing that they say every single day is self custody is the revolution. And that's a fact. There's no better thing that you can do with your Bitcoin than self custody it. Because again, like you said, you know, that's the first, this is the first part is understanding how to hold your own keys. And it's, and it's very easy. You know, I teach a lot of people how to do it and you can teach people very easily how to self custody. And I always liken it to driving. It's like driving a car. You know, the first time you do it, you get scared. You're holding onto that wheel. You're shaking, you know, same thing with Bitcoin. I remember the first time I transferred Bitcoin from an exchange to a cold, to my cold wallet. And, um, it was a little scary. I didn't see them. I was like, where's my Bitcoin at? And then eventually it hits and it feels amazing. You're like, oh, it's there. And it's when you drive, you know, it's scary at first. Then you start driving on the freeway and that gets even more scary. And then eventually like you don't even realize you wake up and you drive and you go to work and you get to work and you don't even remember how you got there, you know? And you're like, how did I, I don't even remember. I was just driving. And it's the same thing with self custody. It, it seems like this huge thing at first, but it's very easy to self custody your Bitcoin. Um, it seems like this huge task at first, but then it gets easier as you do it more, as you start to use coin control, as you start to lay, your transactions, everything becomes a lot easier because it's just second nature and you're used to it. And that's what you do. You don't rely on a bank anymore to handle your money. You don't trust a third party. Uh, you're not using, you know, permissioned ways to handle your wealth that you've worked for. Uh, you're now free and you're controlled by no one because if people can control your money, they can control you. But if you control your own money, then no one can control you when it comes to your money and how you spend it. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Well, that's just another inverted paradigm, right? So like uh, in the current system, you allow other people to control your monetary destiny. Whereas 
you know, you, you keep your money at the bank. The bank takes care of your money for you, right? You don't worry about it. It's FDIC insured. Mm-hmm. We'll take care of it for you. We promise. But what is it? It's a lie. Ah. <laughs> That's right. So Bitcoin flips that on its head and it requires you. Um, oh my goodness. I forgot the word for it, but it requires you to become responsible. Right, you have to be become become responsible for your own destiny, and that is. But what if I lose my password? You, then you weren't very responsible, were you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, it's 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 a journey, right? So you've been we we've all been coddled, and you know if you lose your password for the bank, oh that's fine, just give us your social security number and your and your driver's license. Yeah, can you imagine somebody asking for your seed phrase to help you out with Bitcoin? That wallet's just going to get swept, right? <laughs> and that's that's what the, that's what the fiat economy is doing to you on a daily basis. Just it's almost invisible. They are sweeping your wallet from you and taking it out of your back pocket. Well, because no one, most people who bank don't even realize that the money that's in your bank account. You turn your phone on and you look at your bank account. It's not actually there. It's an IOU as well. It's an IOU. We found that out for sure when what happened in Canada with the truckers back in January of 2022 or whatever that was. And um, we realized that your banks, they don't care about you. Your governments don't care about you. They only care about themselves. And everything that you hold in your bank is an IOU from your bank mm-hmm. to yourself. They as have- much as you haven't had a banking crisis in your country, if you've been to any other country like an Argentina or a Cyprus or what's going on in Turkey or in Lebanon where people are literally robbing the banks to get back their own money, then you realize, well, when times get tough and times get hard, your bank will not have your back. And so at that point, it is required to have self custodied your money. And you don't know when that day will come in the United States or whatever country you may live in. Oh, it's a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> so Truth hurts. do you think uh do you think bitcoin and fiat can coexist short term long term i mean it's coexisting right now right i mean bitcoin's still an infant what do you think about long term no why 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 you you have an opinion i'd like you to explain it in the last two minutes and 20 seconds we have. <laughs> Okay, Bitcoin cannot exist with fiat because people won't accept fiat anymore. And fiat's dying. It's killing itself. It's it's going away. Uh, that's what happens every single day that they print more and more money exponentially. So fiat will eventually die. All fiats fail. They will go away and there will be sound money. There will be new fiats that try to pop up along the way. And some may be successful for a time, um, but if it all just depends on who are the people that decide to say no to fiat. And so if we decide to say no and we collectively stand up and we say we want freedom money, then we will get that freedom money. But if we decide for convenience or for safety or for whatever reason or whatever lie that may be told to us that we want fiat, then we will keep having seniorage and someone who controls our money. Uh, so it's up to each one of us to decide that we want real money, that we want Bitcoin. And um, that's why they can't coexist unless we allow it. Yeah, and if, uh, if I don't leave any of you with anything today, uh, it's just that I want you to keep choosing truth, right? Don't choose lies, choose truth. Make the world a better place. Be the change you want to see. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but uh, the more and more you guys stand here and stand on the side of truth, more and more people, more and more businesses, more and more governments and countries will flock to the cause. It's a foregone conclusion, everybody. It's just going to be time. The truth will out. Let's go. Thank you.